Um, okay, oh, so... Sorry, give me more work to do, sorry. So let's, yeah, let's right. get started on this. Hello and welcome, everyone. Welcome to the, uh, the shadowy cabal in the Gothic castle around the long table of, uh, science folks that are here to make sure that the end of Young Earth creation comes about. <laughs> As usual, uh, I'm, I'm your host today, Gutsit Gibbon. We're here on my channel. But we, as a group, myself, Dr. Dan and Dabber, both of whom you know, we thought it would be fun to go through all of Dismantled, which is, um, <laughs> you'll see. <laughs> and uh, we're going to go through piece by piece on each of our channels. Guys, introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Dr. Dan. Uh, my channel is Creation Myths. Um, so I'm an evolutionary, if you don't know me, I'm an evolutionary biologist. I have a PhD in genetics and microbiology. And uh, what I do on my channel, Creation Myths, is I take very specific claims from creation scientists and like really evaluate them in an extremely dry way. Like we do math and see if what the creationists say actually stands up to scrutiny if you were to like evaluate it as though you were like a peer reviewer going through that process. Uh, and the answer is it never stands up to scrutiny. None of it is right. It's all terrible from top to bottom. So that's, that's what I no. do. Have fun with that. I am, I am both. Shocker. My, shocker. I know. <laughs> I'm dis, I'm, my disappointment is immeasurable. My day is ruined. You're telling me that creationists are sometimes dishonest. This is wow. I, I'm going to need you to do I some mean, thinking. The, the, I will tell you, and we'll see some of this today, and we will see some of this in the subsequent parts of this, because this will this is part one in what will be a multi-part series as we go through this half hour of this dismantled documentary. Um, these arguments are really bad, and they never stand up when you actually, like, do math. Um, so, like, we'll see today how what we talk about here doesn't stand up at all, and then we're going to go through some other arguments that they have in here, and they're... They're just as bad. It's not going to work. Well, they rely so heavily on no one giving it more than a second glance. You know, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Don't look too closely, or you might see something you regret. Please, Dapper, please don't do us. math. Yeah, just don't do math. Yeah, don't do math. Dapper, uh, so I'm Dapper yourself. Dinosaur. I'm a, a noted theropod. Uh, let's see, I have a channel where I do a lot of creation of things, some other bustings, too. There's some stuff about, um, like, anti-maskers, and there's some stuff about homeopathy, and uh, new Age craziness, a um, little bit about silly things atheists say that are wrong, that they say a lot. There's some of that in there. Um, so I'm a bit of an equal opportunity debunker guy. Uh, and I do a whole lot of uh, checking what the sources are that people are citing and saying, hey, that's not what your source says. It says the exact opposite. Well, every Weird. one of us... Every one of us here, I, I'm sure we could all consider ourselves uh, good methodology and source enjoyers uh, and connoisseurs oh, yes. of this, of, of this diving into the methodology and seeing really how it is that we've done this. That's what we're going to be doing today, because this first section, one of six, is going to be on the human-chimp genomic similarity. Um, I'm very excited. Guys, I know you're just as thrilled. Do we want to get this started? Absolutely. So before before we oh, okay. actually get into the documentary, can we just take a minute to explain to everybody what we're what this series is going to be? Because we have a thirty minute video queued up here, and we are only doing about the first five minutes today. <laughs> and so, so for so what this is this thirty minute segment of video uh, features a number of notable creationists, some of whom, if you are familiar uh, with what I do or with what. Erica or Dapper Dino does, you are going to recognize some of the names here. And they go through and they make five arguments in this half hour segment. And I'm going to see if I can remember them without having to, without having to go back. It's so they start with talking about the human chimp similarity. Then they talk about the so called waiting time problem, oh, which we're recording this on February 20th, 2021. This has been something I've been spending time on lately. So I'm just can't wait for that. The end's the waiting uh, time. No pun guy. intended. <laughs> yeah, and I've become the waiting time guy, apparently. That's a thing now. Um, then we get into the uh, mitochondrial eve, was recent, oh, was 6,000 years ago. That's the, then, then uh, one of our favorites, created heterozygosity. You got it. You'll love to see it. And then, you'll love to see it. And then the last part, Erica, you're going to love this one. The last part is, no, it's not out of Africa. <laughs> Actually, it's out of Middle East. <laughs> Criminal. So, Criminal. You, you so what we're going to do... Oh, God. Yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there. So, so we're Real quick, do. I just want to say, I didn't run out of fingers this time to count on, which is nice, because I usually do. Having only real six fingers, you know, becomes a problem. But yeah. this time... Yeah. 
Yes, we got it. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. The anthropoids in the so, room give you mock sympathy. Yeah. Well, you and your, you know, pentadactyl manny. With our full of thumbs. Yeah. Who needs it? <laughs> well, all right. We're so what we're going to do so. is we're going to do each thing one at a time. And then at the end, we're going to kind of wrap it up. So we're going to do this in six segments. We're going to rotate around hosting duties. Uh, since part one is human chimp similarity, this is just right up Erica's alley. So Made Erica's going to be host for part one. This is just right. Can't beat this. So here we are. And um, should we do it? Yeah, I think yes. let's start. It's hard to find anyone who has not heard the often repeated claim that humans and chimpanzees are genetically 98 to 99 percent identical. This has been promoted to the world as proof that humans share a common evolutionary ancestor with chimps. However, recent studies now challenge this claim. That's not proof. No one says it's proof. Right. It's not proof. I mean, it is a confirmed prediction, though. It, it is, is a confirmed, confirmed prediction. It is a confirmed prediction. It is a confirmed also, prediction. It's, it's also not, not just chimpanzees, right? It's, it's bonobos as well. So it's pentroglodytes, panpaniscus, and just as Dapper and Dan noted, it's it's a confirmed prediction, but it's nested within others too. So we should mm -hmm. be more closely related to one genera of African apes than others, and they should be more closely related to us. So not only are we ninety eight to ninety nine percent similar in our genomic in our genome to to chimpanzees and bonobos, but they are also that close to us more so than they are to gorillas, and more so than we are to gorillas. And then yeah. uh, proceedingly to the Asian apes, you know, including orangutans, our, our pongo. Um, then the hylobatids, and then proceedingly out into the, the order of primates. This is a confirmed prediction, and at every single stop, at every single gene on every single species that we're looking at, it's just adding more structures to the lattice that supports evolutionary theory and human evolution. Um, not proves it. My, That's not what science tries to do. <laughs> no. Mm -mm. My favorite variant on this is when you say that this is a confirmed prediction, and then they'll say, well, what about the high similarity between rats and humans? It's like, yeah, they shared a common ancestor, too. Also a confirmed prediction, <laughs> right. because we're all mammals. Exactly. Not only that, where you are contiguers, it's actually pretty close. You're closer to a we're rat than close. you are to a dog. That's, this is true. true. Yeah. This, this is true. Not yeah. only that, too, but rats and mice are less genomically similar than humans and chimps are because they diverged more distantly in the past. So they've changed more from one another still than we the same have from chips. Yeah, still the same still kind. The same kind. Same still thing same with kind. lions and tigers. Same things with elephants and loxodont, the African and Asian <laughs> elephants. It doesn't matter. Um, standardization only matters if it can be in their favor. And the second it isn't, that's when we change the rules. So. <laughs> yeah. Evolutionary geneticists have acknowledged that the actual genetic differences are far greater than we've been told. For example, primate evolutionist Todd Prius states, it is now clear that the genetic differences between humans and chimpanzees are far more extensive than previously thought. Their genomes are not 98% or 99% identical. When I saw yes, this paper, the, the, the first thing that I thought is, okay, that's kind of strange, right? Um, and not just strange because we called him evolutionary primatologist or primatology evolutionist, whatever it is that he said. Um, but I thought this was interesting. This statement is now clear that the genetic differences between humans and chimpanzees are far more extensive than previously thought. Their genomes, so we're considering the entire genome, comparative genomics, are not 98 yeah. or 99 percent identical. Um, and that language specifically is inclusive of not just sequence differences. It's in it also includes structural differences. In yeah, that. right. It's, indels, it's structural differences in the chromosomes, it's inversions, it includes all these things that are not just sequence identity. Exactly. And that's and that's the, the switch difference. Now on the creationist part. Well, and this is why you might hear sometimes, sometimes you'll hear humans and chimps are 96% similar, and sometimes you'll hear 98 or 99. That 98-99 yeah. is for coding base pairs, those, for those protein coding regions. When we're including everything, that number drops to about 96. Interestingly enough, other closely related organisms have a disparity between their protein coding and obviously entire genome that maps, you right. know, scales approximately the same way. Man, man, why would that be? What, that, well, that's I think so it's weird. because... I think it now. I'm not sure. I'm not a geneticist, but I think it's because <laughs> protein coding regions tend to be fairly conserved as a result of strong selection pressure to have functional proteins. Conserved. Whereas, yeah. Whereas non-protein coding sequences oh, are less constrained, and therefore they are freer to accumulate mutations across time. I think. 
Dapper, how dare you? Know. How dare you bring knowledge to this this house of pseudoscience? It's not what we do here. My apologies. So, so let me let me give you the punchline here because I really liked this. So here's here's what they've quoted here. It is now clear that the genetic differences between humans and chimpanzees are far more extensive. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Thought. Wait a minute. Did they take they took one line out of context from the abstract? They did that little trick. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. But that's okay. not the punchline. The punchline is when you. Is going. Let's hear it. So. <laughs> <laughs> consequence, <laughs> one consequence of the numerous duplications, insertions, and deletions is that the total DNA sequence similarity between humans and chimpanzees is not 98 to 99%, but is instead closer to 95 or 96%, although the rearrangements are so extensive as to render a one-dimensional comparison overly simplistic. So this is actually just talking about referring to the exact difference that we were just discussing. What they're going to use it for is to bolster Tompkins's work, young earth creationist geneticist Jeffrey Tompkins, <laughs> his work, mm -hmm. that what we're actually talking about here is that, no, they're not 98 to 99, they're actually 70 or 80. So, obviously, yeah. and, this is and entirely spoilers. deceptive. <laughs> spoilers, Tompkins' work is just getting the math wrong and then going, hey, look, when I do the math wrong, it agrees with young earth creationism, which, yeah, we all now, know. We know. <laughs> Correct. So, I of the three of us, I think I am the least well informed on this specific question, the human chimp stuff. If I remember Tompkins' work correctly, so there's a, a version that he was just do, using a program that had a bug in it that was wrong, and then he corrected it. And if I recall, the the, the highest degree of similarity he got in the corrected number was eighty five percent. It got up to eighty. That's. He got up to 88%. Okay, and that's including not just sequences when you can align them and look at the individual bases, but he's also taking all of these other things, these larger scales, insertions, deletions, inversions. He's including all of those in that calculation as well. We'll get there. We'll get there, because they're yeah, about to mention dumb. that here yeah, in a that's, second. Yeah, that's dumb. So let's oh, of course you're going to mention let's, Hopkins. Let's let him go. Let's let him go. Earlier studies published in the evolutionary scientific literature reported an overall DNA similarity of 98 to 99%. However, large portions of the chimp genome did not align with the human genome, and so were excluded from the reported estimates. Like, alignable regions, yeah. highly variable regions, are utilized to determine relatedness when you're dealing with closely related things. So, naturally, yes, these non-alignable regions, which are going to be areas of mass-scale duplication of single, uh, of single uh, uh, repeats, right, short tandem repeats that are repeating over and over and over again, usually they're going to say, okay, we've got a lot of short tandem repeats in humans and in chimps who can trace this back to single mass duplication or single mass deletion or whatever events, so we'll align the portions that are, that are conserved, as we mentioned, right, deal with the rest of the stuff later. And that's, again, how you get that discrepancy between 98 to 99 and 96. Yeah. I also, there, there seems to be, and maybe I'm wrong, but there seems to be a subtle implication that, oh, the non-alignable regions weren't included to try to, like, pretend that humans are so much... The thing is, okay, first, yeah, science reporting sucks. So my guess is most people didn't get the memo on the why alignable regions are used versus non-alignable regions and whatnot. But also, like, it's not like it was hidden. That you, you read the papers, and they talk about in their methods section, like, well, here's how we align the alignable sequences that we were using to measure similarity. Oh, it's yeah. like, this isn't a secret from anybody. This isn't a conspiracy. I, I forget if they mention it, too, but another thing they like to harp on is the difference in size between the genome of the chimp and the genome of the human, as if the size difference means that any of the differences in size are going to be 100% non-identical and thus drastically change this percentage. Right. Human populations can vary in genome size, obviously not as much as two completely different species, but variation in the size of the genome is, is part of the natural variation within organisms. Genomes shorten and lengthen because of duplication events and deletion events, right? This isn't something that's unheard of. Not to mention... Can, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just saying, we can observe that within just a few generations. So, for example, there are some uh, genomic regions that are, that are repeats that are associated with inherited diseases, where the length of that region, the number of repeats you have is correlated with the severity of the disease, how early the onset is, how severe the symptoms are. And you can look and see if a grandparent had, say, 40 repeats, then a parent might have 60, 
and the grandchild might have 70. And you could see these regions changing in length over generations. The mechanisms that cause that are well understood. And it's unreasonable to think that the consensus size of a region like that would be the same in two lineages that have been separated by a long amount of time. That's just a silly assumption. And like what the creationists do here is they say evolutionists assume that all these things should be basically as similar as possible. And then it's the evolutionist's responsibility to be able to explain any differences there when they should be much closer. As, like, if, as if that's not already that's built wrong. into our understanding of the theory, too, of, of how yeah. organisms do change over time after divergence. Not to mention the fact yeah. that the creationists, they find massive issue with this. This comparison of humans uh -huh. and chimps with different sized genomes. You won't hear them make a peep, though, about comparing lions and tigers, considering them the yeah. same kind because they're genomically very similar, even though their genomes are also different sizes. I, there, there are species of, uh, I forget if it's deer or antelope, I don't know my mammalian stuff well enough to, to know where the delineation is. We'll have to is. fix that later, Dan. We'll fix that at some point, I'm sorry. I know, it's you and Jackson Weed are just like, Dan, stop embarrassing us. Um, so there, there's sister species of, of, I think it's deer, some kind of deer, that are more closely related to each other at the sequence level than humans and chimps are. They're mm. almost identical. But one species has uh, a diploid number of chromosomes of eight, and the other has like 20 something. <laughs> but they're like, one of them just has a few really big chromosomes, and the other one just has a lot of really tiny chromosomes. But yep. at the mm -hmm. sequence level, they're extreme. I don't know if they're cl as close as humans and chimps. I shouldn't have said that because I don't know off the top of my head, but they're right. so so very similar so. at the sequence level. Now, if a creationist was to look at those two genomes, and use the same logic that they're using here, they would be like, no, no way. They can't share common ancestry, not in a million years. Meanwhile, you need to be a specialist to be able to tell these two species apart visually. Yep. Like they, they are identical to each other unless you know what to look for. Hylobatids so like, are the same way. Gibbons, gibbons vary so much in their chromosome number, and yet no one would look at a Lar gibbon and... <laughs> and a Skywalker Gibbon and say that these two critters are not closely related. Right. Same kind. Same yeah. kind. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the problem you're starting with anything ending in, like, I-D-A-E, which is the family level, you know, yeah. ending for in taxonomy. So, <clears throat> you know, cervidae, all the deer. The thing is, these contain far more diversity than you find within... The clay that contains the chimpanzee and the far, far more. Shocking. So if you're going to pick that level as your quote unquote kind, you cannot have a consistent method by which to exclude humans from the same kind as at least chimpanzees. They, they need to cut their losses and just say humans are special. Sorry. You know, they're that's special what, because they're that's special. That's what Jensen does. Yeah, Jensen does that's that. What, yeah, that's what Jensen does. In replacing Darwin, he basically just says it's at the family level except for humans because we were specially created reasons and yeah. then moves on and like doesn't be labor the point that's what Gestures. daniel jesus does he why does it look like, exactly with humans like they're any other part of the hominid kind just like it looks like gorillas are another part and it got like funkies so but then why waste your time trying to substantiate it genomically you know like if you're just going to say it's special anyways why waste the time just do it because right. they know that uh, their followers are are hearing these things and they know that they find them a little compelling weird. because they are. Well, and they find it, a, I'm sure some of them find it at least a little weird that if they were just like, yep, uh, they're, it's, they're just built different, you know? <laughs> Sorry, they're just, they're created differently, even though they were also like made on the same day as all the other animals. Let's, let's continue. We, 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 there was, well, Erica, there was one more thing I think we should mention here that's yeah, important because it's something the creationists miss when they talk about this. When we're doing coalescence and we're doing phylogenetic techniques, the stuff that we care about is the stuff that is inherited vertically from a common ancestor, from parent to offspring. Right. So when, and specifically we're talking about, in this type of analysis, we're talking about how many differences are there. So when we're talking about inherited differences, you can look at something like an insertion or a deletion. And if you have a region that's a thousand base pair deletion, that's not a thousand differences in terms of the inheritance. That's a single event. That's one difference. Oh, yeah. That, that region's gone. So when you do your math, you have to take that into account because we're talking about number of differences inherited vertically. We're not, we don't look, care about horizontal 
mechanisms, which we know occur even in mammals, we don't care about the scale of the individual changes, right? It's the number of inherited differences. Yep. And, and that, I think, is going to come, uh, again, this is not my specialty, no, but no. I think that's going to come into play. This is indeed very relevant. We'll, we'll be discussing okay, cool. this. Let's, let's continue, because I know we're going to get to let's the juicy it. Tomkin stuff here. For instance, the algorithm parameters used in the major milestone publication in Nature reported by the Chimpanzee Sequencing and Analysis Consortium omitted over 100 million DNA letters. Someone tell me, 100 million out of what? 100 million, out, well, if it's a haploid genome, it's approximately 3 billion. Hmm. Okay. Oh, I think they're... 100 million out of 3 I, I wouldn't be surprised if they had actually doubled that number because they were going with the diploid yeah. genome. But I'm not saying they did. I just um, think they surprised did. me. Yeah. Okay. I would Maybe. be... Oh, do you know that they did? We'll, we'll see. I'm we'll just see. speculating. Okay. We'll All see. Right. When accounting for these large non-alignable regions and other omitted sequence data, the actual chimp-human DNA similarity is significantly lower than the 98 to 99 percent identity claims. <laughs> what? Just just wondering. Great it doesn't question. Doesn't matter much, but it's weird. Yeah, why are we seeing that. a gorilla? What is going on here? A mountain why gorilla? Are we not? I didn't even notice that. Good catch, Jack. It's, it's like completely meaningless, but it's just weird. Like, get soft footage of a chimp, man. Just do it. And there, I know there's a lot, too. Like, I know there's probably more of right. chimps than of gorillas. <laughs> when they originally started to ask that question, they didn't have full genomic data. And so they're actually based their estimates of similarity based upon just little snippets of the genome. Hang on. He just said we're basing this on just little snippets of the genome. Now, just little snippets, Dan. We had heard that they omitted a hundred million base pairs out of either three or six billion. So that would mean, let's be nice and say three billion minus a hundred million is still, let me just carry 2.9 billion. One might say that that is yeah. something of a snippet. Would they not? I mean, I feel like if I had, you know, say... Three billion of anything, and you took away a hundred million. I might not notice. Like, Guys, are we have so large, like you know, three hundred billion of some cell type, and you took away a hundred million cells? Like I wouldn't notice. Was it one hundred million or was it one million? Well, let's just give them. Look, even if give it's a hundred, or Sorry. even if it's one, we'll just give them a couple orders of magnitude. Because, yeah, it's the same. It's creationism. You can give them three orders of magnitude, and it still doesn't matter. Yeah, they've got a. There's a real nice buffer there, huh? <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. right. Well, when your typical margin of error is being off by like four to six orders of magnitude with the actual math, we can be really nice to creationists. Just give you, just give you two. I'll just, I'll give you two decimal places. I don't care. Math still works in my it, favor. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, that's that's a that's a great point. All of this is true. It just so, doesn't matter. Er, so, so Erica. Have you ever encountered Dr. John Sanford before? Sanford and I have perhaps, at least in works, crossed paths. Um, I own his best-selling text, <laughs> Contested Bones, um, in which we see, and you'll notice, you guys will notice something, those of you out there in the, in the internet ether, uh, that we don't talk fossils at all in this whole video. Uh, and I can't help but wonder if it's because the last time that Sanford tried to discuss fossils, uh, it did not go very well for him. Uh, in his award-winning text, Contested Bones, for example, uh, we frequently make very basic mistakes that someone who took an introduction to biological anthropology would understand. Um, things like mixing up australopithecines and paranthropians, goofball, <laughs> goofball things like that. Which, by the way, interestingly mm -hmm. enough, they make the case that in Contested Bones, the 99.7% genomic similarity between humans and Neanderthals constitutes Neanderthals as being not just closely related, as in within the same kind, but the same species. They are just the same thing as humans. Um, that is less than a percent difference than the distance from humans to chimps. So, hmm. And they were choosing protein coding sequences, which are the most similar, which are, which, you know, that explain why we have similar biochemistry. So initially we're saying, oh, 98, 99% of the genomes must be similar between chimp and human. If you want to casually say 98 to, you know, 99, whatever percent is similar, it's fine to do it casually. But what you're doing here is you're trying to make some kind of a point 
about the difference between aligable and non-aligable regions and similarity. And when you do that and you say, well, they just said the genome, what you're doing is you're attributing to them dishonesty, which is not okay. No, no actual person working on this said that the entire genome, aligable regions and not, was 98 to 99% similar. No one said that. Pretending they did is a lie. I really wish creationists would do less of it. I, th- I mean, that's, that is more than a fair criticism. And it's something that I certainly don't point out enough is this idea. And, you know, you almost have to wonder, this is me kind of speculating here, but you almost have to wonder if there's almost a little bit of projection going on there, right? Because it's like, they, they know what their intentions are. They know what conclusion they want to reach. So they can only assume that scientists have a conclusion that they want to reach as well. And that they'll do any and everything to reach it, just like creationists will. Scientists do have a conclusion they want to reach. The one that's best supported by the evidence. Yeah, well, yeah. What, <laughs> what emotional stock do they have in being related to other apes? I mean, I mean, I, uh, apes are cool, you know. Yeah, it's cool, but There's like, that. yeah, it's, it's cool, but I mean, come on. The textbooks still say that, but basically geneticists know that's not correct. What is the actual genetic difference between humans and chimpanzees? This is a question that comes up over and over again in this creation evolution debate. So here's the thing. If you if you caught that right there, it was Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, geneticist. Geneticist. Now, now, this is something that you see a lot. So Rob Carter does this too. Rob Carter's a marine biologist, but he'll be like, geneticist. Nathaniel Jensen, he does a lot of you know human gene- human evolutionary genetic stuff. Geneticist. Look. Jensen's degree from Harvard, they'll never let you forget, yet young earthers never let you forget that Dr. Nathaniel Jensen has a degree from Harvard and that you are not allowed to dispute him if you also do not have a degree from an equivalent institution. So like me, with my rinky-dink degree from Rutgers, I'm not allowed to criticize Dr. Nathaniel Jensen according to the young earthers. Now, putting that aside, his degree, cell and development, developmental biology. Now, there's probably a genetics component to that. He may have done stuff in genetics components to that. Um, but, like, come on, guys. Like, we're doing, I mean, Sanford does, Sanford's a plant geneticist, but he's doing all human, uh, he, he's doing population genetics and, like, human paleontology stuff. Like, he's, I just, look, you can learn something throughout your career that is not in the field that you were trained in when you earned your degree. You can, cross over into other fields. When you do that, there is a an expectation that you are going to take make the effort and take the time to become well versed enough in those fields so that you don't sound like you're faking it. And when I listen to people like Sanford uh talk about population genetics, or I listen to Dr. Nathaniel Jeans talk about human evolutionary genetics, it sounds like they're faking it. Because they're saying things that to somebody who has a baseline level of education in those specific things, they're saying things that to that person make no sense. And I just want to point that out for everybody, that there's there's like very clear levels of dishonesty, of making claims that are not true, of of playing the shades of gray between like the human genome versus the alignable regions. And then there's like the more subtle stuff of like just speaking as an expert in a field you have not taken the time to actually become an expert in. And as someone who has taken the time to become an expert in these fields, it's very frustrating to like hear somebody make claims that in my intro to evolution class, if you said the thing that like Jensen says in his research, if you do work that shoddy, like you will fail an undergraduate course in this thing. And it's just, it's very frustrating. And I just want everyone to know that. But that's certainly fair. I, why Why on earth would you, I mean, you might as well, if we're going to be so vague in what we're attributing to these guys, why don't we just say, for everyone, scientist at the bottom? I mean, if you get to just get the credentials for whatever it is that you've tangentially looked into, call, call it all the same thing. I mean, come on. All right, we ready? I mean, it would certainly result in fewer creationists saying, now, wait, what exactly does this obscure field of study that they just cited study? Because, you know, but I don't know, maybe that's nothing. Yeah, well, well, okay, all right. And if it is true we're 98 to 99% genetically identical to the closest evolutionary relatives, evolutionists say. Were they lying when they said 100 million or whatever base pairs, or are they lying now?
Yeah, he was which, good, which, right? yeah. Which he was is good it? right up until that last line. Yeah, which one is it? Where it feels like mm, it, it can't be both. I, I mean, unless you want to say that the human genome, at least the haploid genome, is less than two hundred million base pairs. Which, spoiler alert, it's really not. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> there's got to be a problem with this, and it's it's like it's, we were saying with the math. Like you're just off either way you look at it by orders yeah. of magnitude. For for what reason? Why is this? So I, let's let's just be clear with everyone. What the oh go ahead. Go no, ahead. no, I, I was going to say I'm really curious as to where Jensen actually stands on this because that makes it sound like Jensen isn't like kowtowing to the Tompkins numbers. It, I think they cite the Tompkins numbers soon. I think they actually drop the Tompkins number soon, but like, let's just think about that, because like, we're all very indignant about this, but let's just make sure the audience is clear exactly what the problem is here. A few minutes ago, in this video, they said that you get 98 to 99%, but in doing so, you are omitting Large 100 ones. million base pairs, right? Out of 3 billion, let's say, let's take the haploid and say it's 3 billion. Now, yeah. 100 million out of 3 billion is one thirtieth. Yes, it's one thirtieth, or approximately three percent of the genome. So if you were to take every half or smaller than half. So let's let's actually forget big or smaller. Let's actually do that math. If you were to take that entire region and say zero, zero nucleotide similarity in that unalignable region, that's one hundred that's you know three percent. And add it to the one, and let's say two percent. Let's say two percent difference. Let's say two percent difference. We'll maximize the nucleotide differences in the alignable part, and then take the entire mm, three and change percent in the hundred million that they cited. We're using the numbers that the creationists are citing, and you add those two numbers together, and you get about five percent. So the floor that what they should say as the actual difference, according to the things they have said in this video, the floor should be approximately 95% similarity. That's what they should say, according to the numbers that we've heard so far. That they've provided, mind you. That they've provided, and they've cited. And wouldn't you know it, as we have already heard tonight, as if you actually compare all that stuff, the similarity drops from the 98 to 99 range to the 95 to 96 range. So, so far, everything is consistent it's as long as as long as what Jensen and everyone cite as the actual number as the actual similarity including all the nine line of the non-alignable stuff as long as they land on a number of about 95 percent then we're all good yeah, so, so let's see if they actually hit it yeah so hmm hmm what does <sighs> what does that perhaps imply <laughs> it feels like they're just kissing cousins Well, let's dig down to what the scientific data actually say. If you look at the 2005 chimpanzee genome paper in Nature, you look at subsequent papers, the bonobo paper, the gorilla paper, the orangutan paper, all of them give basically a consistent answer. That most of our DNA can be aligned to chimpanzee and vice versa. And in that region that does align, it's about 1-2% to different in terms of single letter differences. But if you say, Wait a minute, are there sections of human DNA that fail to align to chimpanzee? Are there sections of chimpanzee that fail to align to human? The answer is yes. And it's far more DNA uh, than is that 1 or 2% different. So if you incorporate all of these numbers together, the stuff that aligns and is almost identical, the stuff that can't be aligned at all, you get a number about 85%. What's even more important is what that percentage translates to in terms of absolute differences. So, an 85% identity, 15% difference, in terms of raw DNA letters, represents 300 to 400 million single DNA letter differences. That's a massive number. We just did the ma- like he said. It's at not the game, they math. said they said it was 100 million differences, and then four minutes later, it's three to 400 million. Yep. Which is it, guys? So, so. Yeah. Okay, so let's um, 
Yeah, let's get into this a little bit because I think this is a this is a key this is a key point here. That number that they get that eighty five percent is actually an average taken by a creationist geneticist named Jeffrey Tompkins. And Jeffrey Tompkins, as the story goes, uh, initially published back I think in like two thousand twelve something along those lines. And he published a, a new paper, a bold new claim that humans and chimps are actually only 70% identical. As we said earlier, Glenn Williamson, a computer programmer, came along, noticed that he was using a bugged version of BLAST, and submitted a criticism to the Answers Research Journal, of which Jeffrey Tompkins is the only peer reviewer. Uh, but Tompkins could not get around the fact that, yes, he was using a bugged version of BLAST, and I guess he got more than one uh, complaint, because after this happened... He decided to rerun it, and this time he used a non-bugged version of BLAST, and he also used two other mechanisms of comparison. He used LAST and he used um, NUMEG, something like that. NUMEG, something. It's good. It's good because my first problem is using BLAST is not how you do that. If you submit something to a journal and you say, I did a thing on BLAST, they're going to say, great, can you do the analysis for real, please? Yes. Because BLAST is an online tool where you put a sequence in and then it searches against the database. It's yeah. not a real analysis. It's not. It's, it, yeah, there's, there's, I mean, we could, we could get into that, that too. Like the, the yeah. his, his yeah. scats. Answers, Answers Research Journal is a blog masquerading as a journal. It is not a journal. It is not peer-reviewed, period, full stop. And, like, shenanigans like that prove it. It's, well, that is so sloppy. Well, and, and it's, it's yeah, sloppy. It's not it just... Worse. That's not just us getting on their case there. Like, definitionally, right. because it lacks peer review, it's not a journal. It's just not. Um, but, yeah, it, it does get worse because... Tompkins came out, he averaged what he got in these three different comparison online tools... Um, and he came up with a total of 85% similarity, as you saw. 88, I think, was the higher end, and 73 was the lower end. Uh, and I think he ran it a couple of different times. So, what's the problem with that? <laughs> well, there are a few problems, because first and foremost, Tompkins did not weight his sequences. The sequences themselves that he was actually running were not weighted. So a sequence of 200 base pairs... If that was 0% identical and a sequence of 20,000 base pairs was 100% identical, you would average those and get a 50% similarity between the two of them, between the, the two organisms. He did not weight these sequences whatsoever. Yeah. Okay. I, my, my favorite example or no. like analogy for yes. Christians to understand is, yes. let's say you and I yes. both have a copy of the same translation of the Bible, and somewhere around like Psalm, which is roughly in the middle of the Bible, I, like, delete a letter, and that's it. I just leave it alone. According to Tompkins, that's now a 50% similarity between yep. our nearly identical copies of the Bible, because I deleted a letter and you didn't. Yep, that's, that's problem, crazy. That's problem number one. Sequences aren't weighted. Problem number two is that single deletions or single insertions that, that ruin things downstream, that, that alter things by one base pair downstream, every single one of those is counted as a difference. Every single so, one. Wait, can I... Can I, cl can I clarify then? So what you're telling me is, okay, so there's one question. There's a leading question. Did he do actual alignments? And did he show his alignments at any point? Not that because I know of. if the answer is no, then he's not doing this for real. Okay, if so not, I have a little bit of extra information question. on that one. Can I, can I, Dapper, can yeah, I just, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. so assuming, assuming, Okay, if you didn't do alignments, then forget about it. I'm flipping the table. We're done. Because you can't do this kind of analysis without doing alignment. Assuming he did the baseline level of work you need to do this, um, you're telling me he didn't put gaps in his alignments, and he just, whatever arbitrary starting point for each sequence, once it got out of whack due to an indel, that's insertion and or deletion, then that was it. The whole sequence was just off. Yes, yes. And, yeah, and unless depending there was on a, how a subsequent, unless there was a complementary one in the other sequence, right. so. it happened a few times because he otherwise would have gotten even lower numbers. The fact that he got eighty-eight as his or eighty-eight as his high end and seventy-three as his low end with this shoddy methodology is actually it, it really serves to undermine his point. Honestly, it does. really it does. <laughs> did, did he learn how to do this? And like, what is his expert like? Did he learn? He was informed later that this was a bugged version of Blast. So he did come back with a new version that no longer had this bug, but <clears throat> he did something in this case that was, it's hard to pretend it was, it was unintentional. There's so he did align some sequences, 
But then what he did was rather than waiting the average um, severity by sequence length, he just added up all the similarities and divided by the number of alignable sequences, and that's the similarity percentage. That's how, that, no. Yeah, that's exactly it. No. Um, and There's I, no way. No, 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 it's, it's, no, no, no way. Literally what happened. That's this what is, the math is. This, oh. is. this is why, you guys, I'm not kidding you. This, this serves to have some extra information because when I was researching this months ago, I had the pleasure of stumbling across Dr. Weil's blog. Dr. Weil is another young Earth creationist, and when Tompkins first came out with this information, Weil was to the moon. Once it came out that he was using a bug version of Blast, Weil was like, oh shit, this is really embarrassing. And when Tompkins came out with the secondary number, the first thing Weil did was look for Glenn Williamson's reaction. And when Glenn was like, hey, this is actually arguably worse because he's not wrong because of a bugged version and negligence, he's wrong because he literally doesn't know how to do math. And Dr. Weil said in his blog that he doesn't, he's not holding his breath. Like he, while another younger creationist yeah. said that this can't be trusted, it, it simply cannot. Todd Wood has talked about this before and discussed how it can't be trusted. Another younger creationist, how it cannot be trusted. Uh, and Uncommon Descent has a lovely uh, long conversation about this. And that's an ID community, an intelligent design community that straight up blows Tompkins out of the water. His own peers don't respect him because this is, this math is high school algebra wrong. Like, we, right. it, it's, it is absolutely, I mean. So maybe we should describe what that is, is a little bit because, you know, waiting by alignable sequence length is a little bit obtuse for people who don't do a lot of reading like this. Yeah. So this is basically like, let's say you want to find out your average, um, like, we'll go with like miles per gallon for your car. So your, your car's gas miles, right? Yeah, efficiency. So <clears throat> one day you drive... 100 miles on the freeway and you get a really good gas mileage. The next day you're stuck in traffic in your city. You only get to go like, you know, four or five miles, but it took you like two hours. So you have crap gas mileage. So then you just add up those two gas mileages and divide by two, but that's not what actually happened. You need to divide the actual total gas by the total distance, not just take the two averages. So that's what he, this is what Tompkins did. Rather than adding up the total uh, sequence length and say, okay, well, this sequence is twice as long as this other one. So it's going to count to my percentage, my final average, twice as much because it's twice as long. It's literally twice as much of the genome. He was like, nah, whatever, I'll just average out all the sequence percentages in each different allowable sequence and I'm done with it. And you can you can download anybody out there that that finds this to be like I like Dan over here. Dan is like, there's just no way this is how it went down. You can download his supplementary information and I, run it yourself. That's that's what Glenn Williams well, did. This is so. This is funny because uh, this is I I knew that his alignment was wrong for a couple of the more technical reasons that we've discussed already. I did not realize that he did the math that way. Yes, and that is the main reason that it is wrong. This is one of those things where you you are surprised and astonished and frankly speechless at the incompetence that we see here. And I've had people react this I've reacted this way to other things and I've seen other people react to like no it really is that bad. I've seen uh some I, I know some geologists or mutual friends with some geologists who will be just aghast at some of the creationist claims. And I'll be like, okay, that sounds, you, I'll take your word for it. I don't understand geology, but it's really, that sounds really bad. And then they'll hear me talk about something with genetics that creationists say, and they'll be like, wow, is it really that dumb? And I'll be like, you have no idea. And this is one of those instances where it's like, no, it really is that, that is astonishing. Um, yeah. So keep in wow. mind, um, and, and Glenn, I'll, I'll put it in the description, but Glenn went ahead and took a, a highly variable region yeah. of human chromosome 20, and he thought it'd be really funny to just take this little region and use Tompkins' methodology against itself and compare human chromosome 20 with human chromosome 20. Uh, and he did, uh -oh. and he got an 89% similarity, <laughs> which, which is 1% mm, less great. than the human chip similarity on the <laughs> upper end. <laughs> I mean, you can't make this up. Humans weren't similar to humans. Humans Amazing. weren't similar to humans. Now, of is, that, course, is that crazier or less crazy than Frank Peretti's claim that Triceratops just was a turkey? 
genetically. I, 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 listen, I'm still I'm still hungover <laughs> from from Monster. I'm still hungover from reading uh, Peretti's work because, but that's the thing, right? Like Peretti consulted the likes of of Jeffrey Tompkins. He consulted Dewitt and Wells, which they're they're doing the same stuff where they're just they don't understand what it is they're even arguing with. They, they don't That's get amazing. it. Now, keep in mind, too, that if we were to take Tompkins' work and, as we mentioned earlier, apply it to rats and mice or lions and tigers or an African and Asian elephants, yeah. um, you would yeah. get a similar discrepancy. Because these organisms are all very close to as similar as humans are to, sh- to chimpanzees, right? Um, but that, that discrepancy would exist because the methodology is inherently wrong. It's just wrong. And, and it's not wrong in like a, it's easy to disagree with. It's heat problem wrong. So it's like mathematically wrong. Ouch. <laughs> like you can't, you can't, this isn't a matter that's of interpretations. A, it's not, it's not an interpretable that's thing. That's the new standard. That's the new standard for wrong. Is it, is it heat problem wrong or is it less, less bad than is that? It, and this is, this one is heat problem wrong. Is it unrooted right. tree wrong? <laughs> is it, yeah, is right. it that bad? To, so, you know, at some point we're going to have to have a conversation and we're going to have to like rank these like, we like the volcanic explosivity index oh, we have yes. to do it for creationist arguments where it's like you've got heat problem somewhere in there, you know, like a five is like an unrooted tree and eight, heat problems eight, like, and we'll, you know, Tompkins is like a seven right here. Like we'll have to do that at some point. I we, think. we will because um, it's, it's wholly necessary. There's so much, God, yeah. take all day. There's so much that we can pick yeah. up. All right. So, have we have we sufficiently addressed? So, as the as the non expert on this specific thing in the room, have we sufficiently addressed the human chimp similarity claims? We have. Or is there, there anything we still have to cover? The 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 final statement that I'll say on it is that there is no way to standardize and uniformly compare organisms in terms of relatedness and not have humans and chimps be more closely related than other animals that creationists would consider related, and that's the mm-hmm. problem. No matter how you do it, whether you take 96 or 98, and it's not going to get lower than 96, you're still going to end up with humans and chimps being that much more closely related than rats and mice and African and Asian elephants and lions and tigers, because all of those duos diverged earlier than humans and chimps did 7 million years ago, approximately. So the question is, why are we as different as we are? Because I think everyone would agree that humans and chimps look quite a bit more different than African and Asian elephants. Um, And that's a really good question. We're not really sure. It might be epigenetic, but the problem Uh is... The epigenetic nature of this has no bearing on the fact that what's inherited, what's telling us the relationship between these organisms and how closely related they truly are and when they diverged, that's the information that's evolutionary in nature. And that's the information that's going to to really be problematic for creationists and, and it won't stop being problematic anytime soon. And part two will be on Dapper Dino's, Dapper Dino's channel. channel. That's me, down at the bottom. <laughs> Which we you will can't see it because my head pu- covered, but I'm pointing down. We will publicize hinge. when when we make it available. We will publicize that we'll through also, our various. We'll also avenues. be continually editing all of the descriptions. So at any point, you can go to any of the descriptions and get access to the full deconstruction of dismantled, dismantling, Absolutely. dismantled, as we could perhaps <laughs> call it. <laughs> I like it. There you go. We'll we'll see. But um, so, my gentlemen, of course, very modern apes. We will see you next time at Dapper's channel, where we'll be tackling the waiting time problem. It's going to be great. Uh, next time you'll find yourself here, we'll be wrapping it all up. It's going to be a, a real fun, a real. I mean, my doctor's going to be really pleased at at how my ulcers have just increased in mass. <laughs> you're just going to be one big ulcer by the time you're done with creationism. I know it. I know it. Um, okay, guys. Uh, please make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to all of Dapper and Dan's videos and ch- respective channels. Uh, ring the bell uh, and do the same here. Ring and the bell. please do take care of yourselves.